Hello. How are we? I think we're on today, church. It's been a great morning so far. God is in the building. And why wouldn't you be? So, my name's Francis, for anyone who hasn't met me yet. And uh, it's, it's true, this is a new, new thing for me. I've preached before, but uh, I think communion is a bit different. It's a little bit different. And uh, it was interesting to hear Steve saying that it's, it's, there's more people uh, doing things that they haven't done today and stepping up. And so when I wrote this sermon, it was uh, with sort of myself in mind, stepping up, having been asked to do something that I wasn't sure if I could. And um, so it's great to hear that this message can be uh, for everyone and more than even just myself today, which is how I was able to get the inspiration. So Paul asked me to do this, and uh, he called me up on Thursday afternoon, and he said, I need a favour, and it's probably the biggest favour that I've asked from someone who was baptised this year. And he said, Tanya's sick, and we need someone to preach this week. And I thought it could be you. And I'll be honest, my stomach sank. And I was honoured to be asked, but I felt unworthy. And I was thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm nervous about this Bible study that I'm doing tonight, which I'm still preparing for, and I'm a little bit sick myself, of course, and I'm setting up a Christmas gift book table in the city on Sabbath, you know, so th- there's already a bit going on. And I thought, could I do more? Have I got more to give? And then I thought of what Paul said on the phone, and he said, it's communion, so it doesn't have to be theologically dense. Just talk about Christ and his love. And even though my heart was already pounding, I stopped asking at that moment, have I got more to give? And I started asking, what more could Christ have done for me? What more? There's an expression in sport to leave it all on the pitch. It means you've given it all for the cause. You're tired, sweaty, bruised, battered, but win, lose or draw, you've done all you could. You left it all on the pitch. Christ left it all on the cross. Nothing more could symbolise God's unending love for his people than that man broken, punctured, spat on, humiliated. This This man was God's only begotten son. A man who never once sinned in his life. A man whose destiny was always to be our king to be a king, yet he endured torture and rejection as a response to his love. What more could he have done? In his own words, greater love hath no man than this, that a man may lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. The message is so simple, that we are friends of the Lamb if we follow his commands. And the love contained in the simplicity and accessibility is so is there to see no one could be excluded who can follow these simple rules this was the example of divine equality that jesus set all who labored and were heavy laden were free to come to him we look at the woman at the well it didn't matter that she was a woman normally to be left alone it didn't matter that she was a samaritan an enemy of the jews it didn't matter that she had a questionable lifestyle with multiple partners jesus saw none of that as a reason to disregard His mission was as much for her as it was for the disciples with him, the ones to whom the appearance of the woman barely registered. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What more could God have done for us than to send one like Jesus? And for us, whose thoughts and actions, if laid on the table, would persecute us all. We who pine for God and ask, Lord, make us us whole again. Make us one with you. But even though we ask these things, we still remain susceptible to sin. 
And sometimes we might think, is the bar too high? Should we settle for a worldly existence? Trying our best, trying to be a good person, but always having that get out clause. How often do we hear in the world, I'm a good person, but don't get on my bad side? Even in those that honestly want to do good, there's always that asterisk of protection for when people treat us unfairly. There's always a limit to our love, but not to Jesus. Jesus knew his love and effort would come at a price. He knew who his true friends were and those who sought to harm him. He knew who believed and who didn't believe, but he saw no difference. In the words of the Apostle Paul, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For Christ's whole life, he sought to understand and edify those around him, knowing where it would lead. Can you imagine his mingling in the streets, the sense of salvation that followed him everywhere he went? Can you imagine children and animals circling around his legs as he walked the streets, people listening, commenting, a pointed word here and there from Jesus, a discourse, a parable? Can you imagine the silence when he told his parables? Can you imagine the exaltations and tears of joy as a blind man sees for the first time? All of this swimming in an ocean of understanding that all these things would come to pass, that a price must still be paid, that there is a being on earth who causes us to stumble, a liar so cunning that he would cause as many to receive the love of Jesus as to reject it. Jesus was called to mission. The unblemished lamb required to pay the final price of sin. Our king that should die suffocating on a cross, pleading for God to forgive the ones who nailed him there. And it begs the question, what more could he have done? But there was more. Because as Jesus hung on the cross, awaiting the sweet release of death, He summons the energy to speak and says to a criminal next to him, meeting the same earthly end as him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. When his life was as good as over, Jesus looks for one more chance to convict the honest at heart. He left it all on the cross. I recently went on a trip to Bowen in North Queensland and uh, I was looking after a friend's property. And my plan was to do that for a couple of weeks, then travel up to Cairns and see the Daintree, and go snorkeling, and then I was gonna fly to Brisbane for something as well. But I also had the ulterior motive of sharing my new faith with my friend. Uh, we went to high school together, but I hadn't seen him much since he moved into state. And at the time I was going to be at his house, looking after his house, he was going to be overseas with his girlfriend. Um, so it was, it was a decent favour to look after their, their rural property, um, which was full of fruit trees that needed watering, and also look after their two dogs, two cats, fish, two snakes, seven ducks and seven chickens. Bit of a menagerie. So me and all the animals got on pretty well, apart from a couple of moments. Um, but, and overall I enjoyed my time, but when the two weeks was up, I was ready to leave. Um, but there was a problem. The guy who was supposed to be taking my spot had all of a sudden decided that he didn't want to do it anymore. This put my friend in a tough spot. He was still overseas, needing someone to make their way to the middle of nowhere to look after his place. The neighbours, they all had their own places to look after, and, uh, You know, for me, I had already booked hostels, you know, a car, bus tickets, activities. But I asked myself, could I stay? Have I got more to give? I knew if I stayed, I would get to see my mate face to face. So that was another opportunity. And even though he protested, in the end I told him, look, it's fine. I'll stick around. It's all good. And... I won't lie, at times the extra week was not easy, especially when the snake broke out. 
for the second time. Um, but I knew I had a role to play in God's plan. And even though I was having a role to play in God's plan, I still thought, was well, this worth giving up a tropical holiday? When they returned, I drove their car an hour and a half to pick my friend and girlfriend up from the airport. And they had loads of stories to share, and it was awesome catching up. Hadn't seen him in ages. Uh, we told jokes and stories all the way back to the house. And the plan was I'd stay one more night, then be given the car to take to town in the morning. The only thing that I ended up sharing about my faith that night was that I helped a church in Bowen when I was there, and I go to a Seventh-day Adventist church in Melbourne. That was all the Holy Spirit gave me. That was it. Barely a footnote in the conversation. But my friend, you know, he's working in the mines. He lives in the country. I don't know how many Seventh-day Adventists he's going to meet next year. But now he knows that I am one. He's not religious. Probably a little more anti-God than a believer in God at this stage. But he trusts me. When God gave me the opportunity to make a minor inroad, I knew I wanted to do that more than go on this holiday up the coast. And I left there just praying for my mate and his girlfriend and thinking, well, God, what more could I have done? And of course, I had visions of breakthrough. I had books to share. I had facts to impart. I thought we could discern the signs of the times, you know, just really cut through everything that's going on in the world. But it just didn't come up. Sometimes we don't get to be as bold as we plan. And I think of the disciples setting off on a great sea voyage with Jesus. And all of a sudden, Jesus is asleep. And a storm is raging and they're terrified. And they wake Jesus saying, Master, we're, we're dying. And Jesus simply says to them, where is your faith? Sometimes we plan to be brave and bold. But we must remember that the Holy Spirit will convict us of all things when the time comes. Though the disciples were not as bold as they may have imagined that day, remember where they were. They were following God. My holiday sacrifice was nothing compared to even an hour in the life of Jesus, but I left nothing on the pitch. I flew three hours, spent three weeks, spent an hour catching a snake in the hottest room of their house. I lost money and plans to tell two people that I go to church sometimes. But it doesn't matter. Where we are called, we must go. It doesn't matter the cost. What more can we do? And this might be easier to do for a friend, but the question remains, would you do this for an enemy? Let's look at Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. But Jesus loved him, knowing full well what he schemed in his heart. Ellen White says Jesus hungered for his soul. Do we even hunger for the souls of the people that we love? What about those that do us harm? I didn't mention before, but the guy who was supposed to take over at my friend's house... I actually met him. He picked me up from the airport when I arrived. He showed me around the farm, introduced me to the animals. We talked about life, politics, spirituality. The conversation I had with him was probably the conversation I wanted to have with my other friend. I saw where he lived in town. And we got along quite well. But technically, he kind of ruined the holiday. But he gave his word that he would come back when I was ready to leave. But when the time came, he just stopped responding. And so I can't even say the things that my other friend was, was um, feeling. You know, because he had been living at this, this farm for, for two months rent-free leading up to this time. And my mate had also loaned him a car to use, which he crashed. And this was all to help this guy get back on his feet. He was 
did not have a good standing at back at the farm. But for me personally, I did not hold any resentment or anything against this guy because I saw that things had served a greater purpose. And the only thing I really felt was just a sense of, of pity and just probably wanting to help this guy because it's people that make decisions like this that really need Jesus the most. It's these debtors that have the most to gain from forgiveness. And that is why Jesus, be- Jesus beckons all. The greater the sinner, the more rejoicing in heaven when they return from their ways. If Jesus died for me, then he died for him. And the difference is, he just doesn't know it yet. So, as I was leaving Bowen, all my bags were packed. And uh, I was dropping the the car that my uh, friend had let me use. Um, I was dropping that somewhere. Um, The car that he let me use to get back into town. And I thought, hold on a second, let me just go duck by this guy's house. And I dropped a Steps to Christ in his letterbox the one with the last eight chapters of The Great Controversy. And that was the book that I intended to give my friend from high school. And I just thought, what more can I do? 2 Timothy 2, 24, 26 says, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. We asked before, is the bar too high? But just remember, as high as the bar, as beautiful and glorious the Saviour. All we must ask is what is noble and precious in the eyes of God? What would Jesus do? the one who intercedes for the very one who crucifies him at the moment that he crucifies. And as we contemplate and think, what more could he possibly have done for us? We realise Jesus left it all on the cross. And so too we consider our own lives. We are still here. What more could we do? Where are we called to be? What are we called to do? Will we preach Jesus until the final act? Will we be brave when trials come and others seek to crucify? I nearly didn't preach this today. I thought, I'm busy, I'm a bit sick. But as soon as I considered what I had actually been asked to do, the significance of who I had been asked to speak of, it wasn't a manner of can I, It was how should I start? Thanks.